Good morning. Welcome to Parks Church. My name is Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. I want to welcome you. Uh, come on in, grab some coffee or whatever you need, and let's find a seat, and we'll go ahead and get started. As you are finding your way or getting your kids in, uh, checked in and those kind of things, let me just give you a couple of announcements that those of you who are actually sitting down and listening can, uh, can, can come from in. And that other, uh, a couple of things coming up. We, um, today, uh, just so you know, we're having a family meeting right after this service. We're going to have a little bit of a shortened service. We're going to have a five-minute break and go right into a family meeting. If you're not part of the Parks family, stay with us and hear about what's going on. There's no, no voting or anything like that, but we're just going to be talking about this big transition coming up for us to um, move into this church space that we've uh, d- uh, committed a five-year lease to. You're going to hear about the details about that, timeline, those kind of things, and what we're up to. Um, so stay around for about 20, 25 minutes at the most, and we're going we're gonna to talk through that. You'll have a chance to ask questions and that kind of thing um, during that time. If you have kids and uh, you would like for them to, there will be uh, some caregivers right up here to my right, right after the service. Um, just kind of gather up there. As soon as they're, they're able to transition from nursery and that kind of stuff, they'll come up here and take some kids that want to down to the gym to play while we're having um, the, the, the family meeting. So if that's something that you could uh, benefit from, feel free to take advantage of that. Uh, uh, one more thing I'll, I'll just mention, and we'll talk more during the family meeting after the service, but we have a church work day coming up on November the 20th. So right before the week of Thanksgiving, we're going to meet over there. You'll have some details coming in your uh, weekly emails and those sorts of things, but we're going we're gonna to try to fix up the outside of the building. There'll be some uh, taking down of some stuff like trees and those sorts of things and bushes, and then we're going to try to do some landscaping, pressure washing, cleaning the playground, fixing the playground set and stuff like that. Um, come be a part of that. It would give you a chance to see the new space, uh, to, to invest in it physically with, uh, with, with your, your blood, sweat, and tears as we fix it up and make it look, look nice on the outside. And there'll be some other things coming up that we'll talk about at the family meeting that we'll be doing that weekend as we move forward to making that transition. Today, uh, we are a couple weeks away from finishing up a series on the book of Hebrews. It has been, uh, for me personally, a rich series. And we may be in the, the richest chapters of all uh, this week, next week, and then the, the final week um, before we start an, an Advent series. Today we're talking about faith. We're going to look at Hebrews 11, which uh, a lot of people have referred to as the Hall of Fame of faith. And we'll talk about that and what that means and what that looks like. Um, but th- the question is not really whether or not we have faith. The question is going to be really what we place our faith in, what is the object of our faith. We're going to look at today what it means to put your faith in Jesus um, and, and what, that, what, what that looks like as a life of following after him. So let's stand together as we greet God and one another using these words on the screen as we get started with our service today. The Lord be with you. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. For by it the people of old received their commendation. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists. Let's pray together. God, we, we need you. Um, whether we know it or not, whether we acknowledge it or not, the truth is uh, we need you. We feel our need and we, we grasp outside of ourselves for all sorts of things to meet that need, to be our hope. Help us today. Help us to place our hope in you and our faith in you um, because of our time spent with your people and around your word this morning. We pray it in Jesus' strong name. Amen. Good morning. If you would, uh, let's, uh, let's worship the Lord this morning. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Come lay them down at the foot of the 
Amen. Please be seated. Uh, that's what we're called to do this morning. That's what we're invited to do, to walk in freedom. Uh, but what that means is that we've got we've to reorient ourselves. And that's what Eric was talking about at the front of the service. And, and calling us to live by faith in Him. And in many ways, God calls us to take our focus off of ourselves. Which usually just leads to shame or self-righteousness. So hear God call us to confess our sin together, to stop pretending, to be honest to him and with each other with these words. By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. By faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not see death, and he was not found because God had taken him. Now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, in reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. By this, he condemned the world, and he became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. If you and I would live a life that pleases God, then we would live a life that has faith in God. Let's confess our sin together now using this prayer on the screen. Faithful God, you have never abandoned us or failed to keep your promise. You continue to pour out your steadfast love from your unending storehouse of immeasurable riches. God, though you are always faithful, our faith is so often weak and waning. We fail to draw near to you with assurance. We are inclined to look only to what we can see with our eyes or to believe only what we can fully understand with our minds. Our hope is set too much on this current age rather than the new world that is now coming. Forgive us. Strengthen us. Fix our eyes on Jesus. Give us what we need to endure and to long for and look to the better country, the homeland to come. We ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Continue now in silent confession to this gracious God. continue reading from this chapter of scripture and receive this declaration of forgiveness from God himself. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, 
and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had an opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. The best and brightest of us, as J.C. Ryle once said, are poor, mixed beings. God does not call you to have perfect faith or strong faith (laughs) or faith without mystery and doubt. He calls you simply to have faith in him who is big enough and strong enough and good enough to see you home. That is good news. Let's stand and respond together using these words on the screen. You people who have just heard the eternal truth, lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. In peace, like a river, attendeth my home. In sorrows, like sea, filled
every song you could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever see. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you. There is no one beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder and show. God, we pray you do that, even this morning, um, as we are sit under your word and participate in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us, that you would change us, mold us more into the image of Jesus. Uh, would you do that for your honor and glory and for our joy, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated, and little ones that are headed to your lesson, if you'll come line up up here, we'll pray for you and for us as, as you leave for your time of, le of lesson as we begin ours. As All right. All right, let's pray. Let's pray for our time in God's word, okay? God, thank you so much. Thank you for teaching us. And Holy Spirit, we pray you do that now, that you would illuminate and enlighten our hearts because of um, time spent in your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As they head out to their lesson, <coughs> excuse me, I want to invite um, Katie Woods and Gina Medlin up. Um, and in a minute, I'm just going to go ahead and warn uh, the, 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 the elders. I want to invite the elders up to you know, let's pray for them as uh, after they answer the membership questions and our made official here. Um, we have start. We've we've done. We do this about once a semester at least. We do a little membership dialogue discussion where we go through the five questions of membership and then apply that to the different areas of 
church and, and life and how we, uh, you know, how we operate as a church. So people are able to ask questions and kind of wade through um, who we are and if they want to join us in the mission that, that God has called Parks Church to and in, in a real way to, to join the family. Um, so that's what Katie and Gina are doing this morning. There's others that have been a part of that discussion that couldn't make one of the, one of the sessions and want to still have some more dialogue and they'll be coming soon. Um, and then that may be uh, you. You may want to uh, ask some of those questions and engage in that dialogue and, and uh, consider whether God would have you to be part of the Parks Church family. If so, we'll have a course uh, in, you know, in the new year, but, um, but don't wait. If you'd rather uh, go ahead and do that sooner, then um, John or I or some, uh, one of the elders would love to, to get with you and just um, begin that uh, sooner than later. Um, it's always a joy to, to welcome people to the family. So let me ask you guys the questions, and um, then we'll in- invite the elders up to, to pray for you. Um, do you acknowledge, number one, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God, justly deserving his displeasure and without hope, except in his sovereign mercy, do you? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God and Savior of sinners? And do you rest and receive, or do you receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he's offered in the gospel, do you? Do you now resolve and promise in humble reliance upon the grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes the followers of Christ, do you? Two more. Uh, Do you promise to support the church in its worship and work to the best of your abilities, do you? And finally, do you submit yourselves to the government and discipline of the church and promise to study its purity and peace, do you? These questions come from the, the, our, our founding documents as a denomination, and each word is chosen carefully. And so we kind of unpack that during our time together of what we're committing to as you make these vows to, uh, to be a part of the family. Let me invite the elders up now. Um, and let me, Adam, if you don't mind, if you'll give... Uh, power to this mic. John, would you mind praying for these ladies, uh, leading us in prayer for, for them, and then uh, we'll be able to welcome them to the family. Amen. Would you join me and welcome them to the family? <laughs> uh, if you have a chance after the service, definitely uh, give them a hug. Welcome them to the, the church family there. Um, we're going to go right into reading God's Word and studying God's Word. We can try to keep uh, the, the service compact so we can go into our family meeting. Let me ask Jack Woods, where are you? There you go. Um, well, Get Jack to hobble up here and read, the, read God's word for us. And we ask you to stand in honor of the reading of God's word. shall I say, if time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, enforced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight, women received back their dead by resurrection, some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Others suffered, mocking and flogging, and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed with the sword. 
that went about to see the sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and dens and caves of the earth. And all these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they could not be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and the sin which clings so closely, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Thanks, Zach. I'll encourage you, like I have the the rest of the series, if you can, to keep your Bibles open, or if you have a Bible app, keep that open, because we're going to look really at the whole of chapter 11, um, specific verses we're going to pull out and try to, to get a, a, a sense of what's going on, and we'll, we'll go all the way through the first few verses of chapter 12. Next week, we'll talk about hope, and then the final week, we'll talk about love um, before starting our, our season of Advent, which is, is appropriate. Um, let me get set here. Talking about faith, and as I mentioned earlier, um, this chapter is known as the Hall of Fame of Faith because it lists so many of the Old Testament saints who were commended for their faith. Um, it will be it'd be a good idea, and we may do this sometime to go back and just take this one chapter and spread it out over about eight or nine weeks and look at every one that's mentioned. If we were to do that, which we won't this morning. If we were to do that, what we see really quickly is that even though we call it the Hall of Fame of Faith, man, the biography of each one of these people who are mentioned, what they're commended for is not that they were good people. Let's put it that way. You've got murderers, right? You've got all sorts of sin and things intertwined in the stories of their lives to where if we were to, to list their biography, it would be like the same thing. And they'd be as scared as we would if somebody listed our biography of all the things that we've done and thought. They were, they were mixed up, messed up people. But what they were commended for wasn't their life that they could hold up as a glowing example per se. What they were commended for is that they had faith and not just faith, but faith in Jesus. I've been talking to my kids some lately about this idea of faith as they wrestle through this communicants class and try to, to navigate, like, do I believe this just because my parents do, or is this something that I truly want to own and believe? Um, and, you know, the truth of it is Christians are not different because we live by faith. Everybody lives by faith in something or someone all the time. We all place our faith in something. Christians are different, not because we live by faith, but because of the object of our faith. Everybody hooks their hope or their faith or their surety to something. Everybody carries around a, a structure in our, in our brain that interprets life for us that is informed by what we are placing our faith, who we are placing our faith in. Hebrews, in chapter 11, offers a description of faith and a brief history of God's people who demonstrate faith, and it weaves it in in this masterful way so that you get a, a sense of, of what faith is and how it looks all at the same time. And so I encourage you, go back later on this week, later on this afternoon, and reread chapter 11 and just sit in and ask the questions of faith. We're going to look at two things briefly this morning. What faith in Jesus offers and what faith in Jesus demands. What faith in Jesus offers and what faith in Jesus demands. Let's look first at what faith in Jesus offers. If you've got your Bibles and you're one of the people that doesn't mind underlining in your Bible, I would underline a few verses in chapter 11. Underline verse 1, underline verse 6, and underline verse 16. What happens in verses 1, 6, and 16 are kind of break, it breaks in the action. As he tells the story of all these people that lived lives demonstrated by faith, he takes a break of these verses and he gives commentary that are descriptors of what faith even is. So as he's describing it and showing you people that live by faith, he takes this, this commentary and tells you what faith is. And here's what he says. He starts in verse 1. And he says, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. 
unbelievably packed description of what faith is right there in that one verse. We could spend our whole time there. What does he say? Faith is the assurance of things hoped for. Just stop there for just a minute. Assurance of things hoped for. What are you saying? He's saying faith in general, no matter if you have faith in Jesus or something else, faith is about hooking your surety to something. And and I've benefited greatly from Paul Tripp in, in this definition. But he says this. He says, if I watch the way you interact with others, the way you make decisions, where you spend your money, what would I conclude is the surety in your life that forms the way you deal with everything that you deal with. How we spend our money, how we spend our time, what we uh, invest in, what we think about, how we make decisions, how we interact with others shows that we have hooked our surety to something. Everybody wants to be sure about the life that we live. And so what we do is we place our faith in something that we think will bring that surety. And... If somebody ever attacks that surety, that thing that we've placed and hooked ourselves to, we get defensive. We get argumentative. I ran into a, a, a guy at a coffee shop on Friday that I hadn't seen in a while. And in, in about 30 seconds, he was launching into where his surety is in the political scene. And it doesn't matter if you're red or you're blue and your approach to those things are somewhere purple and in the middle. We all have a surety. And he pretty quickly said several things, assuming that I agreed with every single thing he said. Why? Because he was convinced of it. He had placed his surety, hooked his surety to one political viewpoint, and he could not understand why anybody else would ever see things from a different point of view. We act like we're independent, but the truth is, deep down, we know our need And we hope, we look for hope outside of ourselves, something that will deliver what we need. We're going to talk about hope next week. We're going to unpack the the specifics of what hope is and how it's future looking. But the truth is, deep down, we sense a need and we're putting our hope in something that'll, 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 of what picture of things are in the future. And then we hook our faith to something to get us there, an object of our faith to get us there. And if somebody ever attacks that, we get angry pretty quickly. So surety, assurance, he's saying, hey, listen, faith gives you assurance of what you hope things will be like, where you hope things will go. That's part of what faith is. And secondly, he nuances it and he says the conviction of things not seen, conviction of things not seen. Now, we use the word conviction. We know it. We use it as what's right or what's wrong. Right. We have convictions in life about what's right and what's wrong. Another way to interpret that, to add some color is not just a uh, right and wrong, but a, a perception of things. Uh, it's been said that, um, that we, we don't just live our lives based on the facts, but our interpretation of the facts. We're all interpreters. We look at the world and we can, we can see things and we make sense of it through a certain lens. What he's saying is that faith is what does that. Our system of faith and conviction is the window through which we look at life. We all live Based on our interpretation of the facts, we have faith, a way of viewing the world. You ever think about it, that people can look at the same events, some will laugh and some will cry. You can read something in the newspaper that absolutely breaks your heart and you see other people celebrating it. The same facts, but different interpretations of the facts, different viewpoint and different window through which people are looking at the world. There are things that you do on a day-to-day basis that are absolutely confusing to the person sitting next to you. Why? Because you're looking at the world with a different lens. You're coming at it from a different way. And most of those things that we that form our systems of belief are actually the unseen things of the world. Right? We can, we can make values and, 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 uh, and, and judge um, things that are, are physical, but most of the things that we hold most deeply are the unseen world. That's what it says, conviction of the things not seen, things like what's right, what's wrong, what's true, what's false, what's wise, what's foolish, those things that are intangible, that are unseen, that made their way into our hearts. And we say, hey, we know how we want that to look. We know where we want that to go. We, what we, what we hope things will turn out in that area. And because we know we need that, and we know we, we, have, we have our hope in it, we work backwards, and we, have, we place our faith in something that we think will take us there. 
And when we place our hope or I mean, our faith in something that will take us there or someone that will get that thing for us, it ends up forming and shaping the way we view the world. So we all have faith. We all do that with something. The question becomes, well, what, what sets us apart in faith in Jesus? What makes faith in Jesus something that we would want for ourselves? Well, he goes on. He says faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. But he goes on and defines it more in verse 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Belief that God exists and rewards those who seek him is what sets apart the people described in this passage, the people of God, as having faith in God, is that they believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Now that is something that's extremely basic. But that many of us, if we were to be honest, most of the time don't live in light of. What would change about your daily life if you really believe that God exists, that he's a part of every single thing that you are a part of on a day-to-day basis, that he's with you in the car ride, that he's with you as you interact with that person at the store, that he's with you as you make a decision uh, of what to do with, with this or that thing in your life. What would change about the, the difficulties that come into your life? The idea that sets us apart as people who are, are not just people of faith, but faith in God is that we believe he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. That is a, a, a nod to the idea that God is a God who promises things. That he promises things and that he can be counted on. The rewards talked about here are things that are promised by a faithful God. If you went back and looked through the people that it mentions, there's things, promises that are mentioned like land that Moses was to walk into. Like deliverance that Enoch experienced. Like a children that Sarah and Abraham looked to. Like a sense of approval or acceptance that someone like Abel was after. There's all of these things that are rewards, that are things that were promised by a faithful God. And what they did was they said, okay, I'm going to hook my faith to you. Not to anything else to give me the thing that you've promised. The difference here is in people who don't look to other things to give them what they need, but they look to God. And it sets them apart as the people of God. And that's the third thing you see in verse 16 is as they do this, it becomes a badge that marks them as a a member of God's true people. A member of God's true people. Verse 16 says, as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. It talks about these, this group of people and that he's described here as people that are on a journey to a heavenly city and that God is not ashamed to be called their God. Now, again, if we were to put their biography, if we were to list their lives and spell it out of, of who they were and what they did, it would not be the most appealing resume. But still, God is not ashamed to be called their God. Why? Because they said, hey, in the middle of all of my mess, God, I am hooking my surety on And God says, then I am pleased. Well done, good and faithful servant. We studied the book of Daniel a while back, and we looked at those great names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? Who were called to bow down to a different God, to to bow down as the king even as God. And what what did they do? They said, no, we're not doing it. So they're brought before the king, and he says, if you don't do this, I'm throwing you into this fiery furnace. Do you remember what they said? They basically looked at him and they said, hey, our God can save us from that. So we're not worried about the fiery furnace. But even if he doesn't, he's the one we've hooked our surety to. We're not going to hook it to anything else because we were convinced that he, um, he's, the, he's the one. When you act in, co- in accordance with faith in God and his promises, you stand out. You mark yourself as one who's part of the family of God, and you point others in the right direction. Do you notice it said, and there's that little phrase right in the middle of that statement, that these are people of whom the world was not worthy. These are not 
people who have lost their minds. These are not people who are just checking their minds at the door and don't want to actually do the work of thinking through things. These are people who are the cream of the crop, the best of the best, the ultimate examples of, of what a human could. These are, he describes them as people who went around in, in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, despised. And then he says, people of whom the world wasn't worthy. Why? Because they had placed, they had hooked their surety to God. And he went about to make them into a people that were worthy of that faith. What are you hooking your surety to? What are you hooking your surety to? This passage is saying you don't have to do heroic things to be accepted by God. You have to believe that he exists and trust his promises. That's it. It's not complicated in that sense. Believe that he exists and trust in his promises. You don't have to do heroic things to be accepted by God. But if you believe that he exists and you rest in his promises, then he will lead you to do truly heroic things. Now, you may never be asked or put in a situation where you have to choose whether to live or to be sawn into or any of the other examples that are listed here. But you will stand out if you place your surety, if you hook yourself and say, I'm in this with God. He's the one that I'm placing my faith in. I know I have needs, and I know the only one that can meet those is the living God. So you will stand out. You will become one of those people as he works in and builds your faith. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. So first, that's what faith in Jesus offers. Secondly, it's what faith in Jesus demands. Because there's not just a description here, but there's also a call. A call in the first uh, few verses of chapter 12. Let me start in verse 39 of chapter 11. It says, All these, though commended through their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us they should not be made perfect. Just a, a side here. That should be one of the most convicting statements in chapter 11. Because what he's saying is, the community that we are today is what the people that did all the things described in this chapter were looking forward to. And they're saying, man, one day there's going to be a group of people that have the complete access to God, opened by Jesus himself. And they're going to be able to love each other and live in light and spread the gospel and the kingdom in ways that we can only imagine. They viewed it from afar off. And so we have to do a, a heart check in that kind of a, of a, of a statement to say, man, Look at what all they did looking forward to what we get to experience and benefit from today because of what Jesus has done. And then how are we stewarding that? Let's go on here. It says, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight in the sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the, the shame and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. What does faith in Jesus demand? Three things quickly. First, it demands a good riddance. Secondly, a long endurance. And thirdly, a fixed gaze. First, a good riddance. Faith in Jesus demands a good riddance. The phrase good riddance, if you look it up in the dictionary, it says the action of getting rid of a troublesome or unwanted person or thing. You're saying, get away, good riddance. I'm, I'm, I'm going to shedding this of, my, my, of myself, the action of getting rid of a troublesome or unwanted person or thing. He's saying that is what we have to do with sin. With sin that so easily entangles, that idea of entangles is anything that obstructs or constricts us. Any obstacle in the race that I'm running that is getting in my way and keeping me from the finish line or anything that is constricting me and keeping me from breathing deeply and doing what I need to do to, to get the energy to get across that finish line. He's saying, rid yourself in a violent, uh, radical way of anything that's getting in your way to get you to Jesus. Any anxiety, any ambition, any resentment, any secret greed, anything that, like John talked about earlier, that is turning you in and look to look to yourself, to put your faith in yourself or anything that you can do, Get rid of that. Shed it. Of anything troublesome or unwanted, the sin that so easily entangles. That's the first thing. Secondly, 
It demands you to have a long endurance, to look to a long endurance. In other words, this race is a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon, it's not a sprint. It's going to be something that you put one foot in front of the other as you make your way toward this finish line. And it's interesting there, it's, it's asking us not to just run any race or to run the same race that somebody else has raced, but it says run your race. Run your race. It doesn't do you any good to look over at somebody else and say, well, I wish I had their race, or I would never want their race, because God has placed a race that is in some ways unique to you. You will have your own challenges, your own struggles that you have to endure, that you have to persevere through. C.S. Lewis in his books of Narnia always talk about, they have all these interactions where the characters say, well, what about him? Why does he, he have to do what I have to do? What does that, why does she have to do what I have to do? And what does Aslan always say to him? Well, that's their story, and that's not for you to know. You've got your own. Now run your race that's set before you. Same kind of thing is told to Peter as he asks about John right before Jesus is taken up to heaven. He says, well, what about this other guy? And he's like, I'm not going to tell you what's about that other guy. I'm going to tell you about what's in front of you to run. It's a long endurance to run the race that is set before you. And thirdly, it's a fixed gaze, a fixed gaze, looking to Jesus, who is the author or the founder and perfecter of our faith, the one who, who wrote it, who wrote the story, the one who founded it, and the one who perfects it, the one who perfects it, the one who is running with us to build our faith, to perfect our faith as we run this race. The picture there is, you know, those videos you've seen of the homecoming of troops who've been gone for a year deployed, and they're su surprised, their child or their, their spouse or whatever it is when they're coming home, and you see the fixed gaze of the loved one on the one who's been gone, and then the running towards them, and the embrace that happens. It's the idea of a, of a joyful reunion. And Jesus here is depicted as... Not just the, the one that is going to get us to where we want to go, but is actually the, what we want to go to. He's the object of both our faith and our hope. He's the one we're hoping to be with, and he's the one that actually gets us there because of what he's done on the cross. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. This three-pronged demand that I just described is, is, is what's called in other places of Scripture repentance. Repentance. So really the demand, the call here for what, what we need to do to have faith is to connect that word that's so often connected to it in other parts of Scripture is not only to have faith, but also repentance. And repentance is, is a one-time thing, and it's an ongoing thing. The, the picture would be less, that we're on a road headed in one direction, and it's, it's, we're passing the, the road signs that say to destruction, um, to, to disappointment, to discouragement. And we're on the road going the wrong direction and that Jesus picks us up, the author and founder of our faith, and he puts us on a very different road, going a totally different direction that we didn't even see was there. And then the signposts here say fulfillment, satisfaction in Jesus, the world, the hope of the world to come. All of those things that our heart so desires and that we, that we know we need, but that we were looking for it in the wrong places. So there's a once and for all turning that God does in our hearts when we repent and we say, forget all those other things. Jesus is what I'm hooking my assurance and my hope on. And then there's many repentances, many as in M-A-N-Y and M-I-N-I, many and many repentances that happen all along this road to be with Jesus. As we're walking towards him, as we've had our perspective changes, our tendency is to put our heads down and look at ourselves, and we either stop moving towards him, or even we kind of even drift backwards. Now, the scriptures say that once Jesus has a hold of you, nothing can snatch you out of his hand. So you will never be put back on that road. But that there's a continual lifting of our heads, reminding ourselves, oh, yeah, I keep wanting to look to other things, Jesus, when I'm supposed to fix my eyes on you, help me again to fix my eyes on you, the author and perfecter of my faith, and help me to take another step towards you, another step towards you. Looking to Jesus and running towards you is the idea here. 
Faith offers assurance and conviction. Faith demands repentance. In your race, what do you need to do? What do you need to throw off? Where do you need help? How can you cultivate a lifestyle of looking to Jesus? Everyone has faith. Hebrews 11 talks about people who have faith in God, and particularly in Jesus. And we talked mainly this morning about the description, but don't miss the history of the demonstration of the people that are described here and the encouragement that that brings. We talked about, it talks about in the first, um, first of chapter 12, this, the fact that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. And the, the best message I ever heard on this was given by a pastor named Joe Novenson. And in it, he describes this race scene of uh, you placing yourself in this marathon. And you know how marathons go, especially in the Olympics. They run this whole race of marathon. What do they do at the end? They enter finally the stadium. And that's the scene that's pictured here in the beginning of chapter 12 of a stadium filled with all of these witnesses. There's Moses. There's Enoch. There's David, there's Sarah, there's Rahab, all of these people that have walked this road before you. And then as you, as you look towards the finish line, you catch his eye. It's Jesus himself, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy set before him, which was the joy of being in relationship with you, endured the cross and despised his shame. And you look up and you see him there. And as you're, you're standing there looking at him on this this racetrack, you feel in your hand a baton hit your hand. And what Joe Nevinson says is you look at it and it's got the blood of martyrs on it, of the many who have raced before you that is now handing it off to you. And you look back and you say, what is this? And he says, run, run that race that's set before you. You say, how? I don't know how to do this. I can't do this on my own. And he says, exactly. Don't look at yourself. Don't hook your faith to the to your own gifts or to anything else other than Jesus. Look to him and run that race and watch him not only be the author of it, but be the perfecter and give you everything you need to finish well. Let's pray that he would give us that kind of faith today. God, we need you. So often we look to other things and maybe even particularly our own strength to run the race that's set before us. We think we can just muster up through our own gifts, our own initiative, all that we need to make it through this life. And you graciously rip that away so many times to keep us from, from running to destruction or devastation or discouragement. I pray that you would do that same thing again today. Help us this morning to fix our eyes on Jesus and change the way we view the world because of it. Make us into people that are more and more changed in our daily life because of our faith in you, that we will walk a different road and stand out as those that are marked by members of your family and those that point others to the same place of hope. We pray you do it in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning we're going to come to a time in the table in just a few minutes. We're going to sing first and respond, but let me just remind you as you think about coming to the table that there's a verse in Ephesians that also talks about faith and describes it this way. It says, by grace you are saved through faith. And that's not a gift that's something that you've done. It's a gift of God so that none of us can boast. And so as you consider, as we sing this last song before we come to the table, consider what you're placing your faith in. And if it's anything other than Jesus, then either repent and lay that at Jesus' feet before you come to the table, or don't come to the table at all this morning. And instead, come to Jesus. Um, I, one of us would love to talk to you about what that looks like and how you can do that this morning. Let's respond to the teaching of God's Word by singing this song and by giving of our tithes and offerings. Um, let's prepare to do that even now by using these words on the screen. Because of the generous riches of our inheritance in Jesus, we now freely give the offerings of our hearts to you. Give it to the highways and hedges. 
go to the farthest of fields and go and compel the sick and the well for our father's house will be filled go to the streets of the city bring in a crippled and blind all who would taste this banquet of grace must come and waste no more time come to the feast come to the table the great and the least the rich and the poor come to the feast come to the table You guys stand sing. Over the land will be covered, dressed in his pure righteousness. For all of your guilt, and his blood was spilled. to the table, the great and the least, the rich and the poor, come to the feast, come to the table. Amen. Please be seated. Why does God give us the Lord's Supper? Uh, two reasons, real quickly. First, because thankfully he knows our limitations. Um, God knows the weakness of our faith. He knows that our faith fluctuates, right? Some of us are going to leave this service on fire. And then we'll get a text later today. And everything will change. Right, our faith fluctuates and it's fickle. Right, we've uh, we've anchored our hopes to a thousand lesser gods. Rather than fixing our gaze on Jesus, we're drawn away and distracted by any shiny thing. God knows our limitations. And here's the good news. Here's what I want you to think about when you come to this table. He doesn't leave us alone to change ourselves. Something happens here as we partake in this table. It's not just external symbolism. It's not just some tradition that the church has done. Rather, Jesus Christ gives us this sacrament to actually strengthen our faith in real time. Just as bread nourishes the body, so this supper nourishes our faith. Just as wine revives and gladdens the heart, so this wine, the wine of this supper, does for you and me spiritually as we partake in faith. So come to the feast, not with great faith, but with just faith in a God who wants to grow your faith for you. Faith in a God who has come and will serve you this morning to strengthen you and confirm you and establish you and has put his promises before your very eyes for you to taste and touch. That's what's at this table waiting for you. It's a family meal. Take hold of the supper if if you've taken hold of the Savior, if your surety is anchored in Him, if He is the one who has drawn your gaze, if He's the one that you see on the end of that finish line. If not, if you're not sure, stay where you are. Don't take the supper, take the Savior. Hear Him. Respond to him. Go to him. 
and then come to the table after that. On the very night that Jesus was betrayed, he looked around at a table at his closest friends, guys that had been walking with him, dirty feet for three years. And he said, guys, he broke the bread, and after giving thanks, he said, this is my body, which is for you. In the same manner, after supper, he took a cup of wine, and he lifted it up. And you can imagine their eyes meeting his. What is he going to say? And he said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for the remission of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And the church taught in its earliest days, as often as we come with our imperfect faith to this table, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Let's pray now, and then we'll We'll dismiss by sections, here first, and then here and here. And you come when you're ready, ready for God to strengthen your faith. Lord Jesus, uh, words cannot describe your goodness to us. We thank you that you join the words of Scripture and sermon to sacrament, because we are weak of faith. So we need you, we need you, Lord, to strengthen us, to nourish us, to revive us, to establish us today. Help us, everyone who comes to this table, to come in faith and to leave fed. In your name and for your sake we pray. Amen. You come as you're ready.
This is the body of Christ laid down willingly for you. Taste and see that he is good. The blood of the new covenant poured out for your sins. Taste and see how much he loves you. Oh God, as real as these elements are, be that real to us. As much as they come inside of us and change, Holy Spirit, change us from the inside out. Strengthen our faith today that we might run this race well together. In Christ's name, amen. Amen. Uh, just a minute, I'll ask you to stand as we do the benediction and, and doxology, and then we're going to move. Uh, we'll have about a five-minute break, and then we'll move into our family meeting. If you're a guest, uh, we'd love for you to hang around and stay so we can talk to you and so we can hear about what's going on with the church. I understand if you need to run, um, but uh, definitely love to, to get a chance to follow up with you. And I, what I love to do is grab coffee or, or something like that with those that are visiting just to get to know you better, tell you anything you would want to know about the church and how we got started and that sorts of thing. So uh, you can either talk to me uh, afterwards or you can fill out a, a, a comment card at the end and just leave your information and I'll follow up with you if you want that. Let's stand together and receive, uh, stretch forth your hands in a posture of reception to receive the blessing, the benediction of God. This is from 2 Corinthians 13. May the amazing grace of the Master, Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God the Father, and the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Praise God.